Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. Hey, y'all, I'm Casey Bell from the Shake Up Learning Show, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, friends, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Edu Magic Podcast. Today, I have with me Dr. Tori Truss, who is a past president of the IST10 Network. She is also a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is a professional Chihuahua photographer and a teacher extraordinaire. I am so excited for you to listen in our conversation. It is a little long today, but make sure you guys sit down, grab a grab a cup of coffee, grab your notebook, and and take some notes. You can find Tori's presentation over at sfesich.com slash Tori. That's T-O-R-R-E-Y. Again, that's sfesich.com slash Tori. There you can find the presentation that she's referencing and some additional resources. So without further ado, let's jump right into our conversation. Here we go. Hello, friends, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Edu Magic Podcast. Today, I have joining with me Dr. Tori Trust, who is an amazing professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's also a professional Chihuahua photographer, and just a fun <laughs> fact for y'all. And today, she's going to be sharing with us teaching remotely in a time of need. She posted this presentation out on Facebook earlier in the week, and I looked through and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to have Tori on the show because she's going to share amazing resources, strategies, and techniques techniques to help you out in case you do have to move your classes to an online learning space. So Tori, welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to be part of the show and and share what I've been working on to really help educators in this um, time of need, quite frankly. Right. Absolutely. Well, let's get started. All right. So I put together a series of slides called Teaching Remotely in Times of Need. And I've actually been working on a side paper with some colleagues, and they use the term emergency remote teaching. Mm -hmm. And it's an intriguing term, and it, I think it's a, a better term than using online teaching and online learning because basically K-12 to teachers, higher ed faculty um, are just being thrown into the online world. Um, at a last minute notice, just uh, my university just yesterday said we're moving online for two weeks after spring break, although that likely will be pushed even further. So it's really uncertain times for us to move a couple weeks online versus all the weeks. And <laughs> anyways, I was just, you know, thinking about all the educators who are being thrown into this position and wanting them to realize that there are tools and strategies out there so that they don't have to think that the only option is lecturing, um, sending out readings and discussion forum posts. Like there's a lot of great tools. There's a lot of strategies to use. Um, and so I put together a series of slides that I, I will walk through and, um, Starting off um, with these slides is, is how to use these slides. Um, I've had some people comment of, you know, we're too overwhelmed, we can't do any of this, or, <laughs> or students don't have any technology at home, all my students have no technology at home, there's some of these big assumptions going around and uh, fears and anxieties, and so I, I want to put it out there first of, of you as an educator, you know your students, your class, your content, and your community best. Um, and so it's, uh, I'm not saying every teacher has to go full speed, digital, perfect online and teaching and learning in a matter of days. Um, so that's what I will talk about today are a series of tools and tips and suggestions. And I encourage you to explore just one or two of them and see if you can kind of enrich teaching and learning with your students beyond what you're familiar with, with technology, because there's a lot of really incredible tools out there that can support creative thinking, collaborative thinking, problem solving, all those things that you usually do in face-to-face -face classes. You may not be sure if you can do online. You, you can, because there's some great tools out there. Um, 
and even if you can't, there's, you know, low tech or adapted ways of doing these, you know, you could have students walk around the house and, uh, you know, borrow their parents smartphone and take photos of shapes that they see and analyze like shapes in 2D and 3D and that kind of stuff that they don't have to create videos or media projects that they don't have a lot of tech access. Which leads me into my first step. I have a series of steps that I set up is check in with your students. Um, there's, we already have an issue with digital equity and access um, and creating the whole digital divide. And it's no longer just a matter of do students have devices? That's a, that's a good question. A uh, fair share of students do have access to devices at home. But with this push to so many people being um, told to work remotely, if they do have access to a computer at home, but just one computer and everyone in the family shares that computer, um, that's going to be limited access. Mm -hmm. And what's the what's the Wi-Fi like? Do they have reliable and consistent internet access? Um, so before you move everything to, okay, I'm just going to go straight to Zoom or Google Hangouts and have my students join me, and and it'll just be like a live class. Um, do students can they connect in that way? Um, and so you know, before you even jump into remote teaching, just check in with your students in terms of uh, how are they doing. <laughs> That's um, you know, how how are they feeling about things? Um, do they have concerns about this move to remote online um, learning for them? Is it something brand new? Is there extra support that they need? And also, what kind of technology access do they have at home? And not just access, but competency and skills. So some students can have a lot of access, but may not have had a lot of experience using technology for, uh, you know, digital media production or video gaming or any other ideas, you know, so before you jump into using a lot of technology in this remote teaching, check in with your students. And I actually created a Google form that I use with my first year students, um, and I adapted it for this uh, emergency remote teaching. The first part of the form is just a check in with the students. And I have a series of memes of like, how are you feeling, you know, stressed, happy, sad, um, for my college students, homesick is a big one. Um, tell me more about what you selected and why, and tell me more about yourself. And it's amazing what I've learned from that alone. Um, and so I just added the technology questions onto that because I think we need to just be checking in with our students beyond just, do you have a digital device at home and can you do work? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what's going on? This is a stressful time for everyone. Um, yeah, so that's that's where I highly recommend starting. Just connecting with your students and checking in. Um, and then from there, designing for variability. And this is really important for a number of reasons um, because students may have a wide range of access to technology at home. Their level of comfort with technology may vary. Their level of skills and knowledge and the content that you're teaching may vary. And the more that you design for variability, uh, the better the learning will, experience will be for all students. Um, I worry, one of my biggest worries when we move to this quick remote teaching or online teaching push, um, that the students who struggle already in classes or struggle with accessibility um, are going to struggle even more because we often put accessibility, you know, we don't even think about it when we're designing and really accessibility, universal design for learning, variability should all be at the forefront of whatever you're creating. So I highly recommend exploring the universal design for learning principles. It's one of the things that guides how I teach all of my classes and I have my students explore them in depth. Um, and, and really briefly, there's three main principles. Multiple means of representation is how can you give your students multiple ways of learning? Um, and so often when we move things online, it's here's a whole bunch of readings. You know, read this textbook, read this chapter, read this online article. Um, are there videos out there? Are there images out there? Are there podcasts out there? <laughs> like this incredible podcast, right? Um, <laughs> that you can share with your students um, or even give them choices. I, I saw a teacher one time, um, and this was for in-class session. Um, She's teaching mitochondria and she set up three QR codes. And one was uh, read, read about mitochondria. One was watch a video about mitochondria. And one was listen to a podcast about mitochondria. Mm. And think about what that does for students who um, may be really excited about science, but struggle with reading. And if you just give them a text to read, right. they're going to lose interest and excitement, and they're not going to be able to show their knowledge as well. So if you give them those different options, uh, it reduces the barriers that they face. 
um, which is the whole purpose of universal design for learning is how do we get rid of those barriers to increase access to learning. I love all this. And Tori, before we keep going here, um, I'm sure we have people thinking, where can I get these slides? So I created a, a page called um, sfestus.com slash Tori. <laughs> and uh, people can find the slides there along with some other additional resources like links to the videos that you have embedded within your presentation. I wish that you know they could see me because I'm nodding my head. I'm saying, yes, these are all <laughs> important things we need to consider before we put our content out there. I love the checking in with students through K through higher ed, that's a best practice we need to be doing. And designing for the most, um, with universal design for learning, understanding those different ways to engage, uh, different ways to represent content, content, and different ways for students to show what they know. This is fantastic. And we haven't even gotten to uh, slide six. So <laughs> I am so excited, Tori. This is incredible. Keep going. I, I love your energy, and I hope it like can just you know disperse out through the podcast waves. I feel like to get it to does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I love that um, uh, about you and the, the energy that you bring to teaching and learning, the passion that you bring to it. Um, and so I'm excited to to chat about this today. And and yes, please do review these slides. I think it'll be helpful to have the visual to go along with what I'm talking about. There's a lot of visuals embedded. There's videos embedded, tons of links. It's basically like five years of research of um, all my connections with ISTE and presentations mm, of so things impressive. I've learned put into one slide deck that I'm like <laughs> really proud about. This is my like child amazing. slide deck. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, yeah, so, so multiple means of represent re representation. How do we give students different ways of learning information. Um, you know, are there images out there, infographics, memes, graphics, photos, you know, podcasts. Um, there's a really cool tool called SoundSight, um, which embeds short audio clips into text. That was by the uh, Knight Lab. Um, videos, what kind of videos are out there? Can you make videos for your students? And think about when you are making videos for your students, keep it short and simple, mm -hmm. right? Kiss, yes. A -I -S -S. keep it short and simple for students. They lose attention. You might call it students the same way after about five minutes, just mm -hmm. chunk it, five minute segments. Um, and, and making sure when you do create videos in multiple means of representation that you are adding closed captions, which you can do with ease in YouTube. Um, so upload your video to YouTube, add closed captions, and students who are struggling with English, whether English language learners or students who are hard of hearing or are deaf, they are able to follow along the video by reading the text um, and not be forced to just try and guess what the narrator is saying. That's what multiple mis means of representation is all about. It's giving students multiple ways to access content. I love this. And for our friends who, are at micro who have Microsoft uh, Office 365, Microsoft Stream does the same thing. So it does that trans um, the closed caption for you, which is fantastic. Saving teacher time and making sure our students can access that content. Yes, and, and there's so much I have learned from you, Sam, about Microsoft Immersive Reader. I talk about that. It's my jam. I feel like 24 <laughs> 7 after I learned that from you, and it's actually one of the slides I added earlier this week. Um, and, and, and we can get to, we can get to that. I also learned that um, Flipgrid, for their accessibility, they are starting to add closed captions onto student videos, and you can download. <clears throat> the transcripts from the videos and put them into Microsoft Immersive Reader. So it's like this whole new world of representation where we are not leaving out students. Um, yes. this, this was something I saw when I worked in Southeast Washington, D.C. with a really struggling school and students were like 4% passing rate fourth grade on the standardized tests and um, I was going into the classroom, math classroom, and I, I expected the students to just be totally checked out and, and not care and, and or really struggling. Like, I just didn't know. And I walked in the classroom, and, and students were engaging with the teacher. They were raising their hand. They were responding. And I'm like, okay, well, wonder why they're not doing so well on the standardized test. Then the teacher hands out a worksheet and to all the students, and it's a series of uh, math word problems. And like two seconds later, because I was an instructional aide, like half the class is surrounding me. Uh, Miss Trust, can you read this sentence to me? Mm. And, and the thing was, the, there was a lot of really smart students who uh, did well in math, but they couldn't read well. <laughs> they, they, their reading was not up to par, and that was significantly in obstructing their ability to do math well. 
And um, there's a really great TED talk called The Myth of the Average, um, talking about the high dropout rates of students who are just not engaged, not given these kind of expansive opportunities to uh, learn in different means, which is crazy given that the, the tools we have today, you know, you can have your students create eBooks where they write text and have videos and audio all embedded. Um, and it's just a whole different world that we don't need to limit our students learning anymore because they, we can really open up access with technology. Absolutely. So uh, that was multiple means of representation was the first of three principles. Multiple means of engagement is the next one. How do you engage students through piquing their interest and their curiosity and motivating them? And this is, I know, a lifelong struggle for teachers, <laughs> especially when you get the students uh, who are raise their hand. Why do I have to know this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and I found there's a lot of ways to encourage engagement beyond the extrinsic motivation of grades to more intrinsic motivation. Um, and for me, I found that happens through choice. And choice can be either based on their interest. So when we're exploring a topic, um, you know, say the topic is climate change. Okay, your choice is... Um, go out in your community and find something related to climate change and do a report about it, right? So it gives students um, kind of this freedom and responsibility and, and um, brings more interest in. And it could also just be choice in technology. You know, students are, are growing up in the digital world. We mm -hmm. use the term digital native, but I'm going to steer away from that because that puts assumptions and expectations on students that they know how to use technology for learning when in fact um, many know how to use it for social media. Um, and watching YouTube videos, but haven't been taught how to use it for learning. Um, but if you can bring some of the tools that they do know how to use in, one of my favorites is like book snaps. So students, um, many students are familiar with Snapchat. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, reading can sometimes be dry or difficult or annotating. So now in Snapchat, you have them snap a photo of it um, and annotate it with the, the fun stickers and filters and stuff. And then you can share all of those out. And it just brings this whole, you know, like excitement around reading that I wish I had. I was, I was not a fan of reading growing up. And I'm like, if we had uh, book snaps or all these other, you know, ebooks, multimodal ebooks, I think I'd be much more excited about reading. So think about how you can offer choice either through captivating their interest um, or through different technology options. Um, you can do, you know, in classroom, you may do like stations. Okay, here's four stations. Pick and choose two that you want to go to. Mm -hmm. um, you can do uh, choice boards, hyperdocs. I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, oh, that's my next slide. So I, was say, I think that's coming up. <laughs> there we go. Um, so hyperdocs, playlists, and menus uh, are, are things I think all teachers need to learn about. And uh, I just did a big research study um, with my colleagues Jeffrey Carpenter at Elon University and Tim Green at Fullerton, uh, looking at teachers' uses of hyperdocs, their, um, how they define them, um, and how it impacts their teaching. And it was really fascinating across the board. There didn't seem to be a, a simple definition. It was basically kind of interactive digital lessons and activities um, that uh, kind of replaced teacher-centered lessons. So rather than the teacher standing up in front of the classroom, it was, you know, here's a series of slides or an interactive Google document or a, a playlist of options or a menu mm -hmm. um, where the students have more choice. Now, interestingly, in my research study, there, there's a lot of use of the terms choice uh, but I wasn't seeing it in the example hyperdocs. So I do encourage if you are to use hyperdocs, there are some really good examples out there. And I have a few examples linked on this slide deck. Um, of uh, One of my favorite is uh, the geometry one by Jackie Gerstein, Dr. Jackie Gerstein. And Love it's a her. good example. Oh, right. She, her blog, User Generated Education, if you don't follow it, go follow it. It's, it's amazing with what she does with uh, STEM and STEAM and, and projects that are all student-centered learning. And PDL as well. She's such a great advocate for that. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so her geometry hyperdoc is, you know, it's um, her, the rules, make a copy of the documents, um, complete as many of the squares as you can, fill in the color of the squares that you complete. And there's uh, 12 different squares Students can watch videos, they can use Google Draw to make a picture, 
They can play um, different games. They can locate different shapes. So it's just this like a uh, really cool, well-designed, visually appealing hyperdoc um, that gives students a lot of choice because they can pick and choose any direction. They can, they don't even have to go in order. Um, and I think when we move to remote teaching and online teaching, hyperdocs, choice boards, playlists can be very powerful because um, we don't want students who are stuck in front of someone lecturing for, for a lot of time or just mm -hmm. watch a lecture, go read something, come back and discuss, whether that's um, K to 12 or higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, if you can set up hyperdocs and have check-in points where you are meeting face-to-face, -face, um, but then you let them go and explore, um, that, that will really captivate their interest and allow them um, to pick and choose what they want to do. And this is especially helpful for students who have a, a range of technology access. So the students who may not have great Wi-Fi may not choose to watch the videos because they can't stream them without using cell data or maybe not even access them. Um, so I highly recommend creating hyperdocs with both high tech and low tech activities and letting students choose based on their capabilities and their access. Um, and it just, you know, creates this different type of learning experience where the students are given this feeling of ownership um, and leadership in their learning rather than being told, okay, step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do this, which is, which is fine to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As my slides are literally laid out. Step I was going to say, two, I three. feel like that sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it's fine to do many occasions, but I also encourage teachers to, to, um, break out of their comfort zone a little bit, and I know it's hard to do, and, and put some of that learning and uh, freedom and flexibility out to students, uh, because I'm always surprised what my students create when I give them those choices and options, and I think you would be too um, if you were to set up learning as a exploratory choice-based experience, whether remotely um, or face-to-face. Um, and then the last principle for UDLs, multiple means of action and expression. And uh, I often show in my classroom this cartoon. It's an old cartoon that says, whoever can climb to the top of the tree the fastest, you know, gets an A. And it's uh, a whole bunch of animals. It's got a penguin, it's got a fish in a fishbowl, a monkey, <laughs> um, and some other different animals. And you like, you know, the, the fish in the fishbowl. Like, probably not going to be that, <laughs> that, that penguin has no chance either. And I, you know, and you come back to the same thing with my students in the in the math class who are struggling just to read, let alone like show their math knowledge. If we can give students multiple ways to express their ideas, um, it it breaks down a lot of barriers they face. Right? We often think we are. Um, not standardized learning when we say, okay, well, I'm giving a writing assignment instead of a test. It's like, well, that's a, that's a good step in the, the right direction towards more in-depth thinking, but you're, are you asking all students to respond to the exact same prompt in the exact same way is still standardized teaching? And what about students who may struggle to show what they know through writing? Um, or who have test anxiety, and even though they're really brilliant in the topic, um, just it doesn't come across on a test. Uh, so I try to recommend that teachers explore digital media choice boards. That's one of my favorite things to do. And it doesn't have to be for the final assessment, like you could do a written paper or a test as a final assessment, but along the way, you might have students design products to show their knowledge and build a portfolio. Um, and um, giving them choice in how um, they design products, what tools they use, what they want to design. Uh, it's something I'm doing right now in my virtual class with undergraduate and graduate students is I have a Monday, Wednesday class. Monday, I do a mini lecture. We're exploring how to find and evaluate digital tools and apps. So for example, we look at privacy and the cost of apps and uh, location tracking and <laughs> privacy policies and all of those things um, to understand you know, how, how tools are making money. And on Wednesday, I say, Go to the digital media choice board, pick any tool that you want to explore, and then analyze, you know, this particular tool um, and look at the privacy policy, look at how it's making cost and show your knowledge from the digital media choice board. And I've had students make um, all sorts of things, websites, a lot of mind maps. The students got really into mind maps, um, <laughs> a series of memes. The memes are that like, I oh love gosh. asking students to do memes. They are 
hilarious and they are just, they're my favorite. That's like my, if you are going to start with an easy technology, <laughs> ask your students to create memes because they bring in humor and uh, they can be shared out and they're a lot of fun. Um, anyway, so it's just incredible. And then they all post their designs on Slack, which is a virtual based discussion um, tool. And so I, I just like love scrolling through and I see like, oh, someone created a video, someone put up a podcast on Anchor, someone created a website, and then they get to see all of each other's posts and responses. Um, and it's just this whole rich learning environment that's not a very typical discussion forum where it's just text after text after text. Right. And this, this digital choice board that Tori is referencing, she has lots of stuff on there, um, interactive video, music, um, mind map, I love the meme, comics, create a graphic, lots of different ways for students to show what they're learning about in a way that fits their personality their, and their jam. So I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And you may find, you know, my husband teaches uh, elementary technology and like his students love Minecraft. And so I imagine if a math teacher were to say, pick anything from this digital media choice board to show, um, you know, your understanding of multiplying fractions, there would be a couple students who would find a way to do that in Minecraft. I and love like, it. I think it would be either take screenshots or screen recording, like when they get to pick and choose the tools, I feel like they put a lot more effort in and get really excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so that was designing for variability. How do we give students multiple uh, ways to access and engage with the content and show their knowledge? Uh, moving from there, thinking about how can you use open educational resources? Um, so I talk about, you know, multiple means representation is give students a chance to learn through uh, videos or infographics or charts or, you know, lots of different ways. And you may be thinking, I don't have time to go and find all these things and create all these things. And, and like, it's, it's impossible. So <laughs> for one thing, don't feel overwhelmed. <laughs> you can do this. Um, you can even ask your students to go out and find those things. You know, I have a high school teacher who has his students crowdsource um, environmental science uh, resources for every standard they cover. And he has created this massive Google spreadsheet that collects all the resources, then they rate one another. And so they have like every class 50 different resources to learn from one another. So it's not something you as a teacher like has to do. But you can set that up with your students. You do have to teach them how to find credible quality resources. Um, but <laughs> yes, it, but it, is something you, it is something you can um, ask your students for assistance with. But there's also really incredible open educational resources that are out there that have been designed, just like my Google slide deck um, is, is open access, you know, so anyone can find and share it. But open educational resources um, are actually different than like watching a YouTube video or a TED talk or basically anything you find on the internet. Open educational resources have a particular Creative Commons license um, or public domain license in that they can be freely downloaded, remixed and shared depending on what the license says mm -hmm. and so what's cool about that is if you were to find an ebook um, that could be useful for your students you don't have to have them read the whole ebook you can copy chapters and put it into your own google doc and remix it that way and add in um, some visuals so there's there's a ton of resources out there and some links i have on the slides are the mason oer meta finder which is kind of like looks at i think 10 different oer databases so it's like the it makes sense. The title is MetaFinder. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it's the so that's a good place to start, you know. And I I was surprised. I top, typed in instructional design, something I'm like nothing's going to pop up, and like thousands of resources popped up. And I found eBooks. I found uh, PowerPoint slides. I found videos. It's like this is incredible. That's awesome. Uh, I don't know, Tori. Think, as you're going through all these resources, you said MetaFinder. I'm like, I think that should be Tori's superhero name, the MetaFinder. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Trust MetaFinder. There you go. I love it. The Chihuahua photographer. All right, we're <laughs> making my full title here. Um, right, and so I, I, I think a lot of the Mason OER MetaFinder is more geared towards probably high school and um, higher ed. I haven't looked extensively. I would say for K to 12 teachers also to look at OER Commons and Oasis, uh, which are also great uh, databases that search 
textbooks and uh, websites, digital tutorials, image files, primary sources. Um, so those are really great places to just find. So, you know, just do a quick search. If you have a topic coming up and you're like, how do I provide multiple means of representation? Do a quick search to see um, on those three databases what you can find. And you may be surprised that there's stuff already out there, which will save you time from having to reinvent the wheel. Right. And then I just discovered Smithsonian Open Access. And that's, I think, not only are they trying to digitize all of their like millions of artifacts in 3D that you can download what? those models and put them into Tinkercad and remix them. I've even printed some artifacts from the Smithsonian, but now they're trying to do that with 2D items as well. So this is like, it's got 3 million 2D and 3D digital items from their collections. And this is not just for history lovers. You can have English language arts, you can have students go and analyze an image and write about it, create a story from the image they see. You can have them analyze the math in an image that they see, um, look up uh, images of famous scientists. You know, there's, this is not limited to social studies. So I have that link on the slides. As well, I also have a couple short videos that my instructional design students created about OER's open educational resources because a lot of people there's a lot of misconceptions and myths around what are they and how do you find them so that was a class project for my students so I included those I love it designing for accessibility this is step four but really as I mentioned should be at the forefront mm -hmm. uh, UDL is one way to design for accessibility which is why I have it as step two um, but as but beyond providing multiple ways to access and engage with content, show their knowledge, is making sure that if you are going to create videos, that they do have closed captions, because you can leave out a significant portion of the students um, who either struggle with language or struggle with hearing um, from accessing that content. Same with audio files, making sure there's transcripts available. If you have a class website with images that you embed, you know, doing either captions or alternative text to describe the image. Mm -hmm. um, and, all, you, know, you know, if you're creating Google Docs, Word documents, PowerPoint slides, Google slides um, that you're sharing out with your students, making sure that those are accessible as well. And there's some easy things you can do, like just using the heading features embedded into Google Docs and Word, like heading one, heading two, that helps screen readers just navigate um, the, the document for the student. And a screen reader is an assistive technology tool, so that reads aloud exactly what's on the screen. And so when I talk about alternative text on an image, basically if a student who is visually impaired um, comes across an image and it's not described, it will just say image <laughs> or just like file.png. Right. Um, and the student has no idea what that is. So um, there are things you can do to make your materials more accessible for screen readers, for students who have motor function impairment, who may need to use an alternative keyboard um, or like a head stick or mouth stick to access um, and control their computer. Um, interestingly, uh, and kind of sad, I had my students do the no mouse challenge. Oh. Uh, and pick an educational website where you cannot use the mouse to navigate. They could only use the keyboard. And we went to Moodle, which is one of the most popular learning management systems, I feel, in higher education. Mm -hmm. And Spire, which was our, um, I don't even know what it is, our university where the students enroll in courses and all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Both absolutely horrible. Oh, <laughs> wow. Like the students could not navigate anything in those sites and then they went to Facebook and they're like hey look I can like tab through everything I can select I don't need to use my mouse at all and I was like well Facebook has a lot of money and they <laughs> have probably been sued a fair share of times <laughs> around accessibility uh, and universities are slow to catch up and so you just have to be really smart about you know making sure that what you're designing for students whether it's documents or websites or videos are accessible to everyone and keep that in mind first um, and if you do come across things that are not accessible, that's where the designing for variability is really important. So if you want to have students create 3D models, Tinkercad, which is a great 3D modeling tool, pretty simple to use, is not really accessible for screen readers. Mm. It was not designed that way. Um, so making sure that you do have alternative options for students who may struggle either with using a mouse 
um, to navigate to 3D space or who are visually impaired and can't access and use the site. Um, having either other tools they can use or just stuff at home, like go find some junk in your recycle bin and build a you know rocket out of that or showcase photosynthesis from what you create. So again, design for accessibility. And that's such an important step. Like you have said, it, it links back to design for variability in mind step two with this um, six step process. We, we talked about checking with our students, designing for variability, um, understanding the uh, universal design for learning, having open education resources access for ourselves to save teacher time and to also help enrich our students' learning experiences, designing for accessibility and designing for all of our students, it should be at the forefront. But I think the fifth one, when we talk about stay connected with your students, that's such an important piece of that online of that online learning experience because we don't see them face to face like we do Monday through Friday, or in our case, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But it's so important to connect with our students. And what are some strategies you have around around step five? Yeah, step five is just really important to to me. I mean, when I was in uh, graduate school. It, the highlight of my week was going to class <laughs> and, <sighs> and, and, you know, like the classes were, were good. <laughs> it was really but it was the easy. highlight of your week. <laughs> but seeing my classmates and having conversations with them and like joking around with the teacher and, and those kind of things like just really brought me joy. Like I was like, okay, I'm excited to go see people today. I don't know if, you know, if you've gone <laughs> through the dissertation stage of a PhD, oh, like you don't see, pe you can like go without seeing people for a very long time yes. um, because you're just on your own in isolation. Yes. And uh, grad school for me was like, how do I make sure I have those connections? And I had to build my own outside of class. But, you know, when we think about this rapid shift to online remote emergency remote teaching, um, it's one thing that's really going to be lost. And I saw that, you know, students in uh, China were struggling with the isolation from mm -hmm. one another. And, um, it, you know, there can be uh, feelings of depression can come back up or anxiety or in, around not connecting with peers or connecting yes. a new space. And so um, remembering, and I like the quote that I have on here is online doesn't mean you need to change how you teach. You are still just as human. And so are the students on the other side of your screen, remembering that, you know, your, your students are human and, and crave that kind of connection and support uh, and love from you as an educator. And um, there's lots of different ways to do that. Personally, I will be hosting Zoom classes for my students in a lot of different ways. Um, I really like asynchronous learning where I say like, Here's a massive project. Good luck. I'll see you in a month. Um, but I've discovered <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've discovered that you know the best kind of virtual classes are the ones where even when I do hand them off and say good luck, they still want to see me every week and just check in and get yes. that feedback. And yes. so that's what I'll be doing in my instructional design classes. I've set up Zoom every week. And the first 30 minutes, I'm going to set up breakout rooms, random breakout rooms, where they'll just connect with different classmates and talk about their projects. And then I'll have um, kind of like appointment time. So they'll be in groups of three. Uh, and they're not working in groups of three. They're actually working individually. But they'll meet with me in groups of three so that it's not just me talking to student one-on-one -on -one and mm -hmm. giving the same advice, but right. also that the peers can give advice oh, so yeah. that like... I, I really, I'm, I'm excited to try out that idea. I haven't tried it out yet, but I do it in, in class in small groups. They say, okay, you three are working on, uh, you know, you're doing a virtual tour, you're creating an online website, you're doing the ebook. Okay, let's chat about what's going on, what are you facing, what tips do you have for one another. Um, so we'll be doing that virtually. Again, it depends on what your students have access to. Zoom uh, does allow students to call in, for example, and I just heard. Uh, I just read something where they're saying, you know, can you set up uh, a Zoom classroom that's open 24-7 that oh. your students could email one another and just jump into the Zoom classroom whenever they want to chat. So that's an option. Uh, I work with, uh, you know, graduate students for the most part. So I just say, here's Zoom, Skype, Google Hangouts, and they can pick and choose. They may do FaceTime. They can choose what they're most comfortable with. But I liked that idea of having like an open classroom that students could jump into. Yeah, um, and that that's it, that you're able they're able to connect with each other and just share about life and share about the projects and still have that human connection, which is so important. Yes, yeah, and especially 
given I think the expansion of the, the coronavirus is really going to force people to stay home even more. Mm-hmm. So they're going to lose not only the contacts of, you know, their classmates and instructors, but um, not going out to soccer practice or out like, you know, running around the mall on weekends. You may be stuck inside even more, at least for a couple of weeks, maybe months. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you create those opportunities where students are, do have those uh, ability to connect with one another? And so virtual tools, virtual um, conferencing tools are good for that. But also um, thinking about either text-based tools or asynchronous tools. So mm-hmm. text-based tools, you could set up like a group me type um, or even just an iMessage group or a you know Facebook group, like whatever type of tool where students can text in real time with one another. There's even right. YoTeach, which is um, it's kind of like the new version of Today's Meet. I love uh-huh. Today's Meet because it was a yes. back channel and oh, so students it. could in real time. Um, go and have conversations. Uh, so there's tools like that um, for you know connecting through text if they don't have great access to um, you know virtual conferencing. You can do Slack if you have you know high school kids. Slack might be a tool that allows. I like that because students can direct message one another um, and also chat with the entire class. Uh, and then asynchronous is kind of like discussion forums, mm. but you don't have to limit yourself to text-based discussion forums. Flipgrid is my favorite. You know, yes. it's video-based and students record short videos and then they can reply in video to one another. Or Voxer, which is more of like an audio-based messaging mm-hmm. platform, which brings that human component back to connection, right? Hearing right. someone else's voice, it feels uh, more intimate and connecting than just reading a text that they wrote. Um, right. I, I love Voxer. It reminds me of a walkie talkie on your phone. <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of great tools out there to help them connect. And, and I have a whole list of tools in here for collaborative learning. So beyond just how do you get them connected? Like how do you ensure that they're, they're able to engage collaboratively? I've included some links too. If you are in that situation here where you're forced to move online, there's been a whole bunch of readings popping up of, of people who are writing about how to move uh, online temporarily and things to consider and whether you do asynchronous or synchronous or set up Zoom or Google, you know, there's just a lot of great resources out there. Um, so I have those linked as well. Uh, I just don't get overwhelmed. <laughs> there's, right. there's a lot right. to learn. There's a lot to think about. And that's why I've simplified it into these steps to just kind of like, what do you need to think about along the way as you're designing? Um, and my last two steps are really around um, being there for your students and, and taking care of yourself. And so step six, provide extra support to students. Students likely are not familiar with online or remote learning. I mean, there's actually a lot more students who have taken online courses nowadays, but many have not. Um, It's a different experience. They they need even more motivation. They need even more hand-holding, so to speak. They need more reminders. And so um, think about what strategies you can use to give that extra support, whether you're sending a daily email with here's all the things you need to do like a, or set up a Google keep kind of post-it note with a to-do list that they could check off, you know, like Mm -hmm. extra little steps because um, you lose that kind of face-to-face conversation where you're like, here's all the things to keep track of. And then they're taking notes and then they go on their way and work on those things Uh, online. There's a lot more like fear and anxiety and am I doing it right? And am I doing the right thing? And I'm, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's like the more transparent you can be and the more assistance you can give them, uh, the easier it will be for their learning because, you know, learning's already hard. <laughs> and the easier that you can make learning for them will make uh, make it better for their learning experience and ability to um, acquire the knowledge and skills uh, rather than be limited by, uh, you know, lack of motivation or struggle with tools. Right. And being flexible with, oh you gosh, know, deadlines. Yes. This, is, this is like, we're kind of in uncharted territory here with, this massive rapid move to remote online teaching. Um, And if students are not prepared and you may not be prepared and you're trying to do your best, uh, just, just know that it's ideal to be flexible because some students, they may have technical issues. They may lack the support. They 
maybe um, you know fighting with their family for the one computer in the the house to use to do their work. They may just have anxiety around you know the whole spread of the coronavirus and mm -hmm. misinformation, and information, and there just may be so much going on that the expectations that they do all of the work that they were doing before with ease online um, is not a real expectation. Mm -hmm. and so the more that you can understand that and be flexible and supportive with students, the better it will be for their learning experience. And then, of course, self-care, right? So it's not just about caring for your students, but, you know, you can't care for others if you're not taking care of yourself. Right. And this, this move to remote teaching, you know, as I said just yesterday, our university was like, we're going online and good luck. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, oh, all right. You know, like there's support out there and resources and um, and things, but it's like this whole new pressure of like, I have to send emails to all my students and, and check in with them and, and redesign my courses for the rest of the semester. And I have to do this all because my students go on spring break like tomorrow. So it's oh, wow. like crazy. But then you just have to remember like breathe, <laughs> yes. breathe and do the best you can and be okay with forgiving yourself for not being the perfect teacher that you may be in the classroom in challenging situations like this. You know, you may um, try out different technologies that fail miserably. You may try an activity that students can't actually do and it doesn't go well, which, you know, we experience every oh, day yeah, as teachers. Oh yeah, for sure, right? But like it may, it just seems compressed um, yes. in this, this short time window when you're forced to like move to technology-based learning without the proper support and training. Uh, you just have to be okay with kind of forgiving yourself. Um, setting boundaries is really critical. I saw a lot of teachers who are like, I'm giving out my cell phone to students, which I think is great for building community, but it's also like, tell them when you will and will not communicate. Yes. Like you do need to set boundaries. So you're not like answering phone calls at 9 p.m. every night and on weekends, like you yourself, you're going to get burnt out much faster mm -hmm. um, in this type of situation. Um, and I set up a self-care group for educators um, January 1st of this year. And I post a, a short task every day, it takes 15 minutes or less, um, and just a series of reminders like, you know, try out a breathing technique, like a meditation technique to just help calm your breathing or practice mindful eating so you're not working through your lunch and not paying attention to what's going on and every, the day just feels rushed. Uh, or, you know, get out and exercise or do, you know, yoga as you're watching a video or, you know, like right. things to, to think about because um, this is an intense time for everyone. And, and you, um, the quote I have on here, which I think is really powerful is self-care is giving the world the best of you instead of what's left of you. Yes. Right? And we can't pour from an empty cup, which mm -hmm. is another popular quote, right? So if you're just trying to, you know, be a hundred percent brilliant in everything that you do online, it's going to take a toll on your health. <laughs> and it, it shouldn't, right? This is an extreme situation mm -hmm. um, that you just have to be mindful of like, what can I do every day? Do something for your self-care, whether it's five minutes or 15 minutes or whatever it is, um, just making sure you're doing that. And role modeling that for your students is really yes. critical. That will help ease the anxiety that they um, are facing as well. And that's an important tip for educators and teachers alike. Uh, Tori, I'm gonna recap our six steps here. This was an amazing, an amazing interview and I have one follow-up question before we end today. So our sure. six steps that we talked about, checking in with our students, designing for, for variability, those multiple means of representation, engagement, having students show what they know in different ways. Um, you mentioned tons of technology tools that we can use, but you know, use baby steps at the same time. Don't feel overwhelmed to find one thing that speaks to your teaching heart and that you want to try out and be honest with your students. Hey, I'm trying out Flipgrid for this lesson. If it works, great. We're going to learn from it. If not, let's learn. We'll learn from that as well. Um, mm -hmm. Using open ed resources, lots of resources there, especially the MetaFinder, designing mm -hmm. for accessibility, staying connected, taking care of you and your, your, yourself for, so you can give to your students and be the teacher that your students deserve. My one follow-up question is, for our friends that are student teaching this semester and you know there's all this ups and downs with teaching online what do you suggest for them during this time ups and downs of teaching so student teachers um 
This is a great learning experience. Yes. <laughs> quite, this is a great, great resume builder, this friends. Is, <laughs> this is, you know, there's, there's a lot of schools that are, are moving online. And I'm not saying this is online teaching and learning. There's, there's uh, this whole research field around online course design, online teaching. Um, but what this will do is force teachers to get outside their comfort zone a bit and try more technology. Um, and, and I hope that the student teachers can be the ones who do take those risks and learn the tools and help their mentor teachers or master teachers, um, be the support for their master teachers. So, you know, uh, the slide deck and something we didn't get to is, uh, I have, I think like 20, two slides of different tools that you can use to create enriching learning experiences. Like go through and find one or two of those tools and really learn all about it. Everything, you, you know, how do you set it up? How to use it? How it works well in the classroom and bring that to your master teacher, mentor teacher and talk with them and collaboratively design a lesson using that. Um, this is the, you know, the best time to, right. to experiment and, you know, just not force students to kind of, um, be at a disadvantage because they're pushing stuff online and, um, you know, continuing to, to lecture, or do discussion forum posts, like see if there's something that you can learn from this experience that can really help your current students, but also in the future. Um, you know, I think with the, the way the global climate is setting up, you know, there's uh, natural disasters are hitting like crazy with the uh, hurricanes and wildfires and, mm -hmm global pandemics, I think this idea of emergency remote teaching actually, unfortunately, is going to become a, a more common thing. Mm. And so this is a good chance to kind of, even if you're thrown straight into it without any preparation, uh, like I will be and my colleagues will be, to learn everything you can from this situation so that moving forward next time, you're like, all right, I've got one or two tools under my belt. I am more ready for trying right. to do this in case of need um, or just in your future classroom. You're like, hey, I learned about Flipgrid. Um, let's try and blend class today. Like, so you're, you're really opening up your skill sets um, and opportunities for teaching if you are willing to take risks during this time. I'm not saying a ton of risks, like right. don't go implement all 30 tools <laughs> on the slide deck tomorrow, like you know, <laughs> one or two things this entire semester that you want to try out and get really good at and see if that works with the students and kind of do like a mini action research study. What works? What doesn't? Check in with the students and learn from that. Dr. Tori Tress, this has been phenomenal. Thank you so very much for your time today. And friends, if you want to get in touch with Tori, how can they find you, Tori? I'm on Twitter at Tori Trust, T-O-R-R-E-Y-T-R-U-S-T. -R -E -R -E so feel free to tag me, uh, direct message me, um, or just ToriTrust.com. You can find my contact information there. And I'm always happy to chat at tech or brainstorm <laughs> ideas. Um, this, is, this is my jam, using Sam's word. There. Yes. My jam. Oh, love it. Love it. Thank you so much. This was phenomenal. Thank you. There you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more Edu Magic, check out sfesich.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesich. Until next time, you have the Edu Magic within you.